Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through various RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three different regional hex crawl adventures. The first one is The Evils of Ilmire, which is the longest of the three. This one's 76 pages. The second is Willow, which is a grim micro setting. This one's only 36 pages, but it's jam packed, full of ideas that are really good. And the third of these is The Hounds of Hendenburg, which is only 24 pages. It's designed for the Cairn system, so it's very simple in its presentation. It's minimalist in its design, and it's a great little adventure. I'm going to go through each of these, and I'll probably spend the most time with the first, The Evils of Ilmire, simply because it's the longest. It's 76 pages. Now, it's 76 pages in the main PDF, but you can, when you get this book, you get a bunch of supplemental things. All of the maps are broken out into their own. I mean, all the maps are here, but there are also individual files for each map. There is a player map that you're given for the for the uh, region. You're given a lot of handouts, and you're given conversion documents to various other systems. So it's designed for old school essentials. It's OSR, so you could adjust it on your own pretty easily to any other OSR game. But if it comes with a, a conversion document for fifth edition, it comes with a conversion document for um, sharp swords and sinister spells, and it comes with a conversion document for Dungeon Lord, uh, or sorry, Dungeon World. Excuse me. So. It, it has that built in, this idea that it's kind of system neutral-ish. But again, it's designed for old school essentials, so the main book has all of the, the stat blocks and magic items and things are, are presented in that format. It's a really good adventure. I like this one a lot. A lot of care has been put into making a fun, uh, just a, a fun regional hex crawl that gives you that old school vibe in, in terms of the adventure and, and the monsters you're dealing with and kind of what's happening. I really like this one a lot. Um, the art is also great. And that's another thing the book comes with is a lot of art for this book. It comes with the document with all the creature art for it. Uh, there's also a player handout, which is about four pages, but it gives you some uh, rumors and reasons why your particular kind of character might be there if you're a cleric, if you're a dwarf, etc. It's really good. So here's the uh, uh, mini mega hex crawl adventure. That's sort of the, uh, the tagline for this book. It's a mini mega hex crawl adventure. And it, they're not kidding. I mean, a ton of stuff has been packed into this book in a really impressive way. I, 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 I give them every you know laud and praise for how efficient they are in this book. Now, it's not like it's very it's not very terse in its tone. Uh, it's not very laconic. It, it 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 does tend to go on about some things, but even so, maybe it's the font size. Maybe it's just um, how efficient the paragraphs are. I, I feel like this is a much bigger book than 76 pages, even though it's only 76 pages. There's so much going on in this region. That might turn some people off because it's like, wow, there is a lot of stuff to do in these, whatever, 19 hexes. But uh, other people are going to find this as just a wealth of resources, material uh, to, to play and to play and to play. Now, one thing is, and I've mentioned this before, the maps are Dyson Logos maps. Uh, for the most part, it... it if you know some people don't like that so much, I think it's fine, especially when you're building them out the way that this has been built out. I don't mind the use of Dyson Logos maps in that way, but it certainly is you know like you've seen a lot of these before in other products. In fact, some of these are are kind of the go-to for a lot of other products that you may have seen with those Dyson Logos maps before. So if you've used them in other adventures, you might have to do some adjustments, otherwise your players might notice, hey, we're running through the same dungeon we've run through before. Um, okay, so here is uh, the breakdown of the, you know, sort of introduction to the whole thing, the adventure synopsis, synopsis using the module. It's a four to six size party adventure for low level one to two to start, but you probably get quite a few levels if you played everything through this. Um, again, it's designed to be compatible with a lot of other old school games, but it does work with, uh, again, there are those... Um, compatibility documents for 5th edition Dungeon Lord and Sharp Swords and Sinister Spells. The Adventure Synopsis, essentially there's a cult uh, that's running around this region. It's sort of a, a bog um, and swampy area. And there's this cult that has found this old idol and they worship this thing that is sort of the, the nightmare, the fear mother as they're calling it, which is this horrible creature. And it creates these things called fear spawn which feed on fear and nightmares. And so they're basically trying to go around and make people terrified and they're, they're drugging people to make them have these horrible nightmares and they're taking control of other people using these worms, brain manipulating parasite worms. 
uh, really cool cult infiltrating a town. We've seen that before, but it's a good, it's an interesting vibe, right? It's the, a nightmare cult. It's not trying to, you know, bring about an undead apocalypse and it's not trying to, you know, um, do anything like that. It's just this really creepy idea that we're going to make people terrified. And so that obviously is going to play into the tone that you're playing with this adventure. There's also a lot of, like, kind of quasi-factions running around here. There's a lot of stuff that's in this region. Even before the cult took over, there's this thing called the Observer, a legendary resident of this region who has already, in its own day, been causing trouble for everybody. There, People thought there was a curse because of what it's been doing to kind of research and observe and see the results of its quote-unquote academic study. And that's interesting, too, because it's it's a villain, but it's also something that's more reasonable than the cult, in a way, and certainly can be negotiated with, maybe even worked with. It's a cool little feature of this setting. Now, you get a breakdown of, like, fighting against the cult with campaign start and adventure hooks and general notes and details. This is what I meant when I said sometimes it does tend to go on a little bit, like... If you read through this paragraph against fighting against the cult, it basically breaks down how you're likely going to stop it. It says, well, they can stop the poisoning of the well, they'd have to do this. And if they want to stop the... Um, and, and then, of course, the cult will try to take vengeance and probably do that. And if they're going to try to sneak in or they're going to try to stop the production of this or they're going to... Like, a lot of this stuff could just be gathered from reading the adventure or the players might find their own ways of doing these things. Um, like one thing it says is that in order to to you might have to like make a rousing speech in town in order to get the people to to side with you that would be the way that and that's the sort of advice that I don't think is necessary in a book like this like players are going to figure out how they're going to do it you know you present the 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 motivations you present the locations and what people are doing there and you don't necessarily then need to tell the the GM how the players should try to solve it like they'll they'll figure it out but it's it's minimal and um and, and, you know, can be overlooked, at least in my book, because the rest of the book is great. <laughs> it's really, really good. You get a, a rumor table, and then there's a, a, a crystal gazer, a fortune teller, that you can go to see once a day. And she has these visions she can see, and they're um, helpful in one sense. They're very, very obscure, but they do relate to particular hexes and adventures and things going on there and ways of solving or what things to be a, a, a care, you know, look out for. But they're, they're often really obscure, so I, I think it might... You might want to translate them a little bit more for the players when you're actually going to run it. Uh, there's climbing events if you're climbing mountains, and then here's the hex map itself. Uh, very simple, and I like how the things that are in that hex are drawn prominently, so you kind of at a glance know what you're looking at um, with the hex map that follows. Now, one of the things you get with this book is a uh, screen inserts for your for your GM screen. And it has the map of the town with the NPCs and the locations there. It comes with the hex map and the the breakdown of each hex on there as well. So you have all of that in your GM screen right right there if you want. So you don't have to have the PDF or the book open while you're going through, which is great. So 19 hexes, and they're all given a brief description here. They're given a bigger breakdown later. This is just a, at a glance, a paragraph of what's going on in that hex, which is great, and then a weather table. And here's the gazetteer of the of the place with the breakdown. Now, one of the things that makes this this adventure awesome is that basically every single hex, with a few exceptions, has a dungeon. That's crazy. There's basically I think like 15 dungeons all said and done in this in this uh, hex crawl. That's awesome. None of these hexes are boring. There's a few that are not. They don't have dungeons, but they still have reasons to go there. There's still interesting things happening there. That's crazy. I mean, so much stuff. You could obviously leave out the dungeons you don't want. You could, you know, uh, leave stuff out if you if you felt this to be too crowded. But just, again, ensure, ensure amount of stuff happening out here in the swamp. There's a lot. Um, there are rules, by the way, for how, you know, also encounters in each hex, special encounters in each hex, which connect you to particular other hexes or to the dungeon or just are kind of interesting in and of themselves. So there isn't a, a general encounter table for the for the entire forest. You get a specific encounter table for each hex, which is really good. Uh, there's a druid out here who needs to be helped. Um, there are uh, mantis people. There are frogling people. There's uh, lots and lots of crypts and ruins. And there's a there's an old dwarven forge which is hidden up in the mountains, which has been lost. Old mines. Uh, there's a logger camp, of course, and stuff going on there. Uh, bandits, because of course there are bandits with a bandit stronghold. And then there's the king's highway where Esmeralda is. You get the map of the town, which is Ilmire itself. A very simple map of the town and what's going on here. Essentially, the main people, almost everybody, has been taken over by the cult. 
uh, the, the, the the priest has been taken over by the cult or is it one of the cult members the tavern keeper is the mayor is sick and dying it's just everybody is everything's bad here <laughs> everyone's kind of afraid and hiding away and the cult is in charge of it. now they're going to try to keep that on the down low and one of the interesting things that, that, that this adventure makes clear is that because this is kind of on the king's highway and it's on the main path, there's a lot of traffic through here and a lot of people coming through. And so the cult isn't necessarily going to just like come out and kill anybody every time. Because if they do, like that's a problem. They don't want to be caught up. The town is under their control, but they're trying to keep that fact on the DL. And so that's actually kind of cool. The players can come here and as long as they stay here just for a day or two, the cult isn't going to act against them. And even if they just kind of go out into the wilderness and do a few adventures that aren't directly harmful to the cult, they might still not attack them. So the players are going to more slowly discover this. There's something wrong in town, but it, there's always been a reputation of a curse here. So it's not necessarily going to ring any bells that something is you know, immediately wrong with the town, especially since the cult is going to do its best to kind of get the players to, to move on. But if they start causing trouble, then it's going to try to take control of them or assassinate them or do these things. That's, that's great. Here's the Inn of the Weary Wagoner, which is where it's sort of one of the big dungeons here, the cellars beneath it. It's one of the, the main places of, of the cult's power. And then there's the Defiled Temple of the Luminal Star, which is in Hexatine. It's the same, it's the same place. It's the, uh, it's the old temple that used to be dedicated. It's been taken over by the cult. The priestess has been imprisoned, and the new priest who replaced her is actually not a priest. He's actually a cultist. So it's a great... Um, there. And then beneath the town, there's one of the fear spawn, which is layering, and so it's like soaking up the fear and nightmares of the, of the townsfolk as they're being poisoned with these potions of, of nightmare and fear in the town well. Really interesting stuff. And also the, the po potions, I think, are made with mercury or something, quicksilver. And so the people are getting sick, too, in addition to being afraid supernaturally. They're also just getting afraid because of this seeming disease that they don't know what's coming from. So there's a lot going on in this town that's bad, and it all comes back to the cult here. There's Rancidius the Defiler. Uh, very evil, old school evil, right? His father Rand, though, of course. Um, then this is a fear spawn, and they're really cool creatures. They're like, I mean, this is like looks like an Atiog, right? That's probably what the stat block would be for it. But um, there's lots of really interesting uh, artworks for the different creatures you're dealing with. Here you have again more of this uh, Dyson Logos art, and you've seen this one before. This this is one of his, I think, most popular in terms of uh, <laughs> being used by a lot of people. This double cliffside bandit. Uh, fortress sort of thing. I've seen this in a lot of different books. It's it's well used here. I'll say that's well used here. And they get brief descriptions of every room with this stuff in them. Uh, abandoned copper claw mines, the prismatic grottos of the fishmen, the gecko pit and buried bastion, the mound of the mantis men, the webbed hollows, great dungeons with evocative names, the forgotten crypt of the lost clan. And I think all of these dungeons are at the very worst solid, competent dungeons. And some of these are really cool with what's going on here and with the faction play that's going on and how it affects the overall story. So I think this is a, these are almost, not again, not all home runs, but they're really good. I highly recommend, you could just take any of these out if you wanted to run it on its own and, and just run it on its own. But they're, uh, they work well with the setting. The Obsidian Forge of the Lava Dwarves, that's a great name. Uh, and with Scoria the Fire Demon. The Lava Lord and Lava Dwarfs here. Prison Vault of the Demon Warlords, with some great demon art for them dealing with the demons. The Fungal Caverns of the Swamp Witch. And then there's the Vile Lair of the Nightmare Cult itself, with Virica the Vile, and the Mayan Phage Worms, and the Fear Mother. Great old school art for each of these things. I love that. And here's the Observer's Tower. The Observer is uh, a beholder, basically, as you would expect, something called an Observer. And it is just experimenting on the region, on the people there. It's been doing so for a long, long time. And it's actually not, I mean, it's evil, but it's not just like chaotically, destructively evil. You can work with it. And this is the subterranean complex beneath its tower. And those complexes connect to the Underdark. And there's a whole region underneath. It's not a huge, it's not, it doesn't go underneath the entire entirety of the hex grid, but it goes through a lot of it, the western section. That's great. There's a whole extra underground portion here. That's awesome. This is also all in a supplement, supplemental document, too. And then the Jashara, Zeshara and the Assassins, who is a... Um, the cult can hire her, and she's going to be tracking down the party and like going to be a repeated villain out there in the wilds when they just least expect her. Um, 
There's the beast here at the end, which is all laid out in OSE um, stat blocks. Straightforward, easy uh, to read. It's you know kind of blurs together just because of the the way that the pages are formatted, but you can pick out the individual entries that you want easily enough. Quite a lot of different entries here. And then there's a treasury of artifacts with all the magic items you can find in this adventure with a great piece of art there at the end. So the Evils of Ilmire is an absolute home run. This is a great regional uh, adventure. And if you're, if you're starting off a campaign in Old School Essentials and you don't know where to go and you don't want to do a huge campaign, this would be a great place to start. It's old school in its tone. It's very evocative. It's got a theme that's going to go through the whole thing. But there's a lot of options for the players to go and investigate non-main, quote-unquote, story-related dungeons and adventures. A lot of places to slowly build up and gain levels until you uh, confront the cult and figure it out. So it's a great starting uh, adventure for Old School Essentials. Um, I, I would highly recommend this. I want to run this at some point because it's just great. And you could, again, run a really... Uh, a great regional adventure here and uh this will take you from level one i don't know how to high, you know to what level you'd end if you did everything probably pretty high because there's a lot of stuff here a lot of treasure and a lot of magic items but great awesome awesome adventure highly recommend the evils of ilmire i'll put the link below to where you can get it the second of these regions is willow which is a grim micro setting this is a really i think this is by the lazy liches this is by, uh, or Lazy Lich, excuse me. This is a really great, uh, very little, but great regional hex crawl. This is the whole region. These hexes are not very big, and there's really only, what, like one, two, three, four, five locations? Yeah, there's really only five locations besides the starting the town that you're in itself. So it's a really small, minimalist setting. When it says micro setting, it's serious. This one isn't a mega micro setting. <laughs> this is a or a mini mega setting. This is a micro setting. Uh, there are forest encounters, river encounters, and corrupt forest encounters right there on the front page. It's how to use this. You just sit it into any system. It's statted out for swords and wizardry, but you could convert it to any game easily enough because everything's really minimalistic here. Uh, how to fit it into an existing game if you don't want to start a campaign here. Be easy enough to do. Essentially, there is a town with a river ferry that's stopped. And so you could either get stuck in town or maybe you're sent to investigate why the river ferry has stopped. Either way, uh, it'd be a great way to do there. There's different play styles that are, um, well, it's essentially an explanation of the old school play style, where the following points are assumed to be true. And you could change any of those points if you wanted. I like that. If, you, if you're not used to doing old school games, then these points would be a great way to just prime you and maybe even your players on what sort of thing you're about to get yourself into. So essentially, you have this town of Willow, which is laid out on these two pages here. There is a dungeon beneath the town, the, the only majorly detailed dungeon in this region. Um, and the town is pretty gloomy. People are not terribly happy right now. There's uh, Things are breaking down. Things are uh, starting to... Bad things are starting to happen. And the person who is the judge in town, Morose Morgan... Uh, she is this witch who has banned magic here except her own yearly crop ritual. But that's starting to fail, and people are starting to get hungry. And so kind of the, the overarching fear here is starvation. The townsfolk are getting more and more and more antsy and anxious and depressed and, and angry as the food starts to run out. And it's running out for a number of reasons. But it's great. So, hooks, why you might get stuck in Willow, rumors about the town, weather and key descriptions, with the key NPCs detailed here. And I like, it's interesting, there's a what is this character doing now section at the bottom. So it's like, when you run into them, where might they be? Um, so you want to you wanna use the River Ranger? What's he doing? Well, maybe you run into him while he's sleeping somewhere strange, or he's eating his magic me meal, or he's collecting a special moss for a new bedding, or he's being carried by rat folk to their burrow to be eaten. He's not fought bat yet because he wants to go this direction anyway. He's really lazy. That's his kind of key thing. He is super lazy. So the ranger who's kind of there to protect everything is just devoted to laziness. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Sonia is the only upbeat person in town. Everybody else is pretty depressed. So, you know, but some tables aren't going to like that so much. They don't really want to get this sense of like, ugh as things are, are going. But, of course, that maybe is the reason to fix things, is to get everybody up. There are some boats that you can hire to try to get out of the village. With locations here, the Blue Brew is the only inn. The room's there and who's in it. Um, the description from outside and inside with the guests. The rumors you can overhear and the uh, proprietress. Now, one thing is that 
well, here's all the different locations. One thing you'll get is um, these tables. You have a cause and effect list. And so if the players do X, this is what's going to happen. And that's kind of cool, but it's also, I mean, it's kind of cool in one sense, right? If you're if you're brand new and you don't have a lot of experience with this sort of like reacting to the players, then this is a great, uh, you know, this is a great table. It also kind of gives you a sense of what's going on. Like you read through this and, and you get a sense of people's motivations and possible reactions. And that gives you a sense of what is actually going on and the different power dynamics and what really people are trying to get to. And like th that's all good. Um, but I think that you, a lot of this stuff would probably depend upon the actual circumstance. So for example, if you enter the seaweed shrine, then this will happen. We'll be exiled when you reemerge. The villagers will restrain players and take any treasures they found and give them to Morgan to return to the shrine. Um, is that always going to happen? Does it have to happen? You know, this is up to you to really see if this cause and effect list will happen. And therefore, it's more of a suggestion. And I think, I, again, I use it as more of like a, hey, this is the sort of thing that is going on in town. And this is the sort of thing that might happen. And this is this gives you a sense of the tone and, and the, the attitudes to things. That's how I would use this rather than every time this happens, that other thing will happen. There's also this relationship prompt table, which is unnecessarily complicated read vertically and you have these different symbols and it's it's not like i mean you know you can get it in a, in a in a glance but it's really just who likes who who is intimidated by who who's never met who like do you need every single one of these i don't know i think this this page is probably the least interesting it's the one i i spent probably the most time just like okay who's you know which character was that again and oh that's right okay they're hostile to them okay but i think if you printed this out and just had it up it might be a little bit easier because then you could be talking to someone and then the players the players could be talking to someone rather and then they mention another NPC and at a glance you could say oh that's right this person's intimidated by that person so they're going to probably say this as a response or about them you kind of keep it all in your head you don't or rather you don't have to keep it all in your head right there and then there's like this table for how the different people in the inn think about each other and I don't know I, again it just seems overly complicated for what you're getting I don't know if I would use this. I probably wouldn't. I would just get a sense of the people and then play it as I see fit. But you could also just, you know, keep this up. And, and there is some interesting dynamics going on here. So if you really want to, to to play up the town and the interactions of the town and make that a main really thing going on here, you could easily do that. Um, all right, there is the their, their view of the different factions. And there are crow folk, rat folk, the okalisk, which is this undead obelisk <laughs> mixed with a dead dryad and an old necromancer was buried in a tree underneath the tree and it grew up and it's corrupting the wood and it's making these evil dryads or kind of undead dryads and all this stuff. The interesting you know, sort of a uh, plant necromancy thing going on outside. And then there's the wizards who are just in a tower nearby kind of just doing their own thing, but they are a faction and they can do things they could help or they could hinder you. Uh, here's what the, the different Factions think about the different groups. So what do the wizards think about the Okalisk? What do the rat folk think about the Okalisk? What do the rat folk think about the wizards? And it's just, you know, the different dynamics with all the different factions. And you get the Seaweed Shrine, which is the dungeon beneath the town. It's a really cool dungeon. It's these undead elves, aquatic elves. And so it's all kind of elf aquatic themed. And there's some cool puzzles down here. It's laid out really, really simply with, you know, in some cases art on the pages to show you what's there uh, of keys for example in a treasure chest but everything is described right on the page or the main ones are described right on the page the eel room the guardian room etc uh, with a description of each of these along with the monsters that might be there bolted at the end and their powers which is cool the art in this book is really great it's flavorful it's not uh, going to be everyone's taste because it's a very particular style but i think it's it's great it it's uh it helps build the theme of the whole adventure i think it really works um, the dungeon itself is is great. As I said, it's aquatic themed, and so you've got seaweed shambling mounds and seaweed seaweedlings and aquatic elf skeletons and undead electric eels. So it's really cool to have that one particular theme going through the entire uh, dungeon. I think that's great, and more dungeons need to be like that. There are descriptions of each of the hexes. One of these is a great place, the Forbidden Fortress. There's a smoke dragon there. That's awesome. And there are reasons you might go there, because the... Uh, there's a call greater lightning uh, spell <laughs> and um, or a scroll there. And that's, I, I really like that. Uh, there's a wizard's tower, which is great. There are two wizards here. It's really funny. There's an old wizard and a young uh, female wizard, but the f young female wizard 
in most games would be the apprentice. In this one, she's an elf. So it actually turns out that the old guy is the uh, is the apprentice, and he's been her apprentice for you know most of his life. She's an elf, so she lives almost forever. I think that's great. Uh, it's a you know that reversal of expectation. You often go to okay, yeah, so the old bearded wizard, he's the old wise one, and then the new apprentice is young and you know uh, ready to to learn all the secrets. Like actually, no, it's the reverse there. Uh, there's what the wizards want and what the wizards fear, and how they will change over time if nothing happens. Um, then there's a brief description of their tower, which is great, just a few rooms, but interesting things happening in those rooms and, and uh, a random magic item generator, which is really useful, not just here, you could use it anywhere in this uh, setting. This is a great page, Evil Plants in the Corrupted Wood, because the wood is getting, you know, necrotic and, and destroyed, or I mean, you know, corrupted, um, you have all of these otherwise normal plants becoming becoming bad and, and, and really unhealthy and, and dangerous, but also not necessarily just useless. Can be, in fact, useful if you, uh, if you do it right. But you also want to be careful about some of these things. Like the nightmare flower is a great one. Every time a character sleeps with this flower nearby, they have a terrible nightmare. One of the petals falls in the morning and one creature from the nightmare is born into the world nearby. That's a great, great little uh, piece of world building. You know, you could use a nightmare flower here, but also in any game. Maybe they spread from here after this occurs, and now that's a thing the players can run into. That's awesome. Crow folk. These guys are funny. They are interesting. There's only 25 crow people, and 15 of them are more warriors. And very soon they will be turned into, some of them at least, will turn into undead. And they're, uh, they're trying to figure out what to do. They have a culture of joyfulness and excitement. And there is widespread toxic positivity and denial about the severity of the problems they are now facing. That's kind of funny, right? Especially as you contrast it with the town, which is all gloom and doom, and you come out to the Crow Folk Village and everyone's like totally falsely happy. Uh, uh, you know, nothing could be possibly wrong. I think that's really funny. It's be a nice contrast. They're um, basically at war with the, the Rat Folk, which is another faction here. Um, and the Rat Folk you can deal with. They're pretty much probably going to be bad, but you can... Um, change the dynamics a bit by engaging with them on less of a just I'm going to kill all the rat folk. Rather, you know, actually engage with them on a uh, okay, we need to switch out the king who's the current king is Fester. If you can get rid of him, then the new king, something will happen. And that's sort of explained in the if the players kill the king then a new tournament will be called and the new king who doesn't want to do deals with the evil undead and will, will flee. Or at least will uh, um, will uh, separate and fight against the uh, the, the undead when they march on the town, because that's one of the things that will happen if nothing else happens, is that the undead will march on the town. Here is the evil being out in the woods, the necrotic Trent, a treant, right? There's the Okalisk itself. What does it want? How do you destroy it and its defense mechanism, which is kind of cool. And then the Ashen Dryads, which are the things that it creates. That's really, really interesting. With the overland monsters that you can run into, a Wailing Willow, a Venus Wolf, an undead crow folk, rat folk. And then the timeline of possible events that lead out to 15 days. So if you want to, you could stick to this timeline and assuming nothing changes or the players don't do anything, this is kind of what will happen in two weeks just about. That's an interesting element to have. I always like having an if the players do nothing, this will happen. Because obviously they will do things, but it gives me a sense again of what people want, what the motivations are, uh, what... You know, and, and what the overall goals are, even if they're thwarted. How are the, Then you can say, okay, well, now that the players have done X, which thwarts this plan, how is the villain going to react to still bring about the plan? I like that. So timeline of possible events is a really good inclusion. At the back, you get random treasure with basic, advanced, and rare. And throughout the adventure, it'll say roll on the random advanced treasure table or roll twice on the rare treasure table, things like that. And then Dismal Dan supplies. Dismal Dan is the uh, shopkeep in town. That's what you can buy there. So here is another one of these, again, very small settings, but it's another great one because what's going on here is really interesting. There's a lot of cool world building here. This one has a much more, uh, I would say, flavorful cast of characters in town. The Evils of Ilmire has a couple important NPCs, mostly they're villains. Everybody else is very quickly detailed. This one is almost expecting you're going to spend a lot of time in town and have understand the different characters, the NPCs, and their dynamics and get to know them and care about them, maybe even despite the fact that they're gloomy and and a bit, uh, you know, odd. <laughs> Maybe that'll make the characters like them specifically. But it's also a great little town 
with lots of cool flourishes and I like the tone of the whole thing. It's grim, but that's the point. You're trying to overcome it and I, I don't mind that sort of grim, even maybe even like a note of uh, depression <laughs> if the goal is to overcome it. I like that. So highly recommend Willow as well. The last one I'm going to cover here is The Hounds of Hendenburg, which is, again, the smallest of all three. This one is only 24 pages. And if you guys know Cairn, you'll know minimalism is kind of the name of the game there. It's minimalist in its design, in its presentation, in everything. Um, the Even in its art, it's all very much drawn from online and maybe like, you know, uh, given filters to make it uh, useful here. Here's the table of contents again, minimalist. Here's the introduction, essentially there are these hounds, spectral hounds that are going around through this forest and devouring people. And they're coming from this crypt who used to go hunting with them. He was a tyrant. And now the hounds need to be dealt with. That's basically it. There's no like direct adventure. There's no like quest. The, there are some hooks that you're given, reasons why you might want to deal with them or the bandits or the, the hags, because there are bandits and hags out here as well. Um, but it's sort of otherwise left to you uh, when it says defeating the hounds. Though no objective is assumed for the adventure, it is likely that most parties will wish to rid the cryptwood of the bandits. And there are three ways of doing so. You can't kill them. That won't work. So you have to try to banish them or seal them away or get them to leave. Those kind of the three ways of doing it. You can do it through the pastor, you can do it through the hags, or you can do it through uh, by dealing with the guy himself, the tyrant himself, and letting him go, essentially. There are some factions there, again, the crones, the, the highwaymen, and then Hendenburg itself, the town, which is kind of, it's really interesting. The description of the town is that it's close. I love this piece of art. It really gives you the sense of what's going on here, which is that it's about to be overgrown. <laughs> and that's the idea, is that the town is constantly being overgrown. It's like the, the wood is pushing against the town. There's a D8 tables, uh, a table of rumors here. It seem all useful. And then the different people of Hendenburg and what they might ask the party to do and what they know. That's kind of cool. Um, you get the lord and lady, you get the poacher, you get the pastor, the miller, blacksmith, the coroner, and the innkeeper. The coroner is interested in the witches. The blacksmith is interested in the innkeeper, but it didn't work out. Uh, and something went really wrong, and so he is kind of it, made a mistake with the crones, the hags, and so that's something you're going to do there, or deal with there. Then you get the forest itself. This is it. This is the whole, the whole description of it. It's very brief, and there are rules for random encounters not even really included here. There's a link to where you can find more about wilderness exploration, but that's it. <laughs> it's very, again, minimalistic, and it's not, not a lot is given to you. There's a list of random encounters with some of the locations. An owl boar is the creature that you're kind of running around from. There's the Cryptwood Hounds themselves, the Grindelo and the Highwaymen, Sly George and his sidekicks, along with the supposedly dead wife of one of the characters from the village, but she's actually run off with this guy. He's also made a promise to marry the one of the hags, but he reneged on that deal, and so now he's, uh, you know, in a bit of a pickle with them. They want him dead. So that's kind of an interesting bit of conflict there. Uh, you get the Villa Ruins, the Elfwind's Hunting Lodge, the Site of Battle, the Crones, the Bear Cave, creepy ca descriptions of the Crones themselves, and the Tyrant's Tomb with the statue. And then you get the dungeon, the Tyrant's Tomb itself, which is very simple, straightforward, and, you know, again, minimalist in its presentation. What's in each room, very well laid out. It's clear what's in each room. Uh, bolding and bullet points. Great design in that regard. A little bit of art, but I mean, just, just to give you a, a flavor, right, rather than anything that's helpful in the dungeon, but it's still cool. I like the flavorful art, as long as it's kept to that, that minimal, as long as it fits with the sort of tone of minimalism, and I think this does. That's what you're going for here. The sarcophagus room, and then after the adventure with a few things that will happen if and what, depending on the players do this or that. The party does nothing. If, if, if this one happens, if that one happens, if Sly George survives. With the player's map at the end, and then a page for use with Cairn. And that's it. That's the whole setting. So very, very minimalist. Now this one's pay what you want, which is great. You can just use, you know, you can uh, pick it up, try it out. And if you like it, give them a dollar, give them a couple dollars. But otherwise, you know, uh, it's again, has that infinite value relative to its cost. So um, if you quibble with the simplicity of it, I mean, you can't really, because again, it's free. So the other ones uh, do, uh, the other ones are not free. 
But that's fine because I think they're much bigger and much more robust and a lot of work has been put into them. Not to say that the Hounds of Hindenburg isn't, hasn't had work put into it, but it's, it's simple and it's designed to be simple. It's, it's just a, a quick thing that you can put into your game or not. Ilmire and Willow are both bigger and more commitments if you're going to run them. Hounds of Hindenburg is a couple sessions. Uh, Willow was probably a few sessions. The Evils of Ilmire could be a whole campaign. So it makes sense that they're, you know, that they're, they have that higher cost. But I'll put them in the, 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 the uh, descriptions below. And, you know, they're not really all that expensive. Again, given what you're getting, I highly recommend all three. Well, I hope this has been interesting, guys, and I'll see you in another video.